Hi, I'm Max Allen Collins, and I'm the author of Killing Town, and I'm here chatting with Mr. Media. My over-the-backyard fence neighbor and I have been exchanging books back and forth for years. And as a result of this show, I have introduced him to several mystery authors published by the Hard Case Crime imprint. I, I think it's safe to say that we share a favorite among them, Max Allen Collins. I wasn't sure of this until a few months ago, when the latest batch of fiction that my neighbor dropped off on the porch for me included a stack of Quarry detective novels by Collins. Now, I may have introduced him to Quarry, but he bought all the ones he had not yet read and then shared them back with me, which was pretty cool. That's a fan. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Collins back to the show for the third time. We're going to focus on his latest deep dive into the literary state of the late detective fiction writer, Mickey Spillane. It's called Killing Town, and it's a gem, and not just because it represents, I think, the 10th posthumous Mike Hammer novel that Collins has written from partial manuscripts and notes that Spillane left behind when he died in 2006. No, this one is special because it chronicles Hammer's first ever adventure, written in the 1940s, but it was never published until now. Now, since the last time he was here, Collins has seen his own character, Quarry, brought to life on Cinemax. He and his wife, Barb, celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary a few weeks ago. And he has endured and overcome some serious health challenges. I'm delighted to get a chance to catch up on all of the above and more today. Max Allen Collins, welcome back to Mr. Media. Good to see you, Bob. Good to see you. Especially good to see you. <laughs> well, good to be seen, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> right. Now, is my count correct? I, is it, is it ten, I, was, I was using the uh, asterisks at the end of Killing Town where you put the books in order. Is, is 10 right or is that wrong? I believe 10 is right. I, I know when I get to the end of this contract, I will, have, I will be at 13 books, 12 novels, because there is a book of short stories. Yeah. called Long Time Dead. And that's the first and only My Camera short story collection. Probably won't ever be another one because I've used up all of the short fragments on those. And at 13 books, that will be doubling the number of My Camera novels. So that may be my exit point. I I'm, I'm now only have a few things left in the, uh, in the drawer uh, that with my camera or or that can be converted into my camera sometimes uh the the character can't it, it wasn't my camera but can be converted into my camera mm. uh haven't done that yet but that's a possibility that that remains um uh, where are you in terms of maybe maybe for folks who 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 didn't see a previous interview explain kind of how you came into this a little bit and uh I know you and you and uh, Mickey had a relationship, but also then what you received from the estate in terms of material to work with and to do all this. Well, we don't have time for me to tell the whole story right, of right. Mickey Spillane, <laughs> but uh, suffice to say, I was a, a huge fan, particularly as an adolescent, and that uh, after I became a professional, we we became friends, and I began to visit him in his home in South Carolina. And we did some projects together. We did a bunch of anthologies, and we did uh, we did a documentary together. He was that was about him and, and my camera called my camera's Mickey Spillane, mm. the reverse of what it usually says. <laughs> uh, and then he was in my, both of my my mommy movies, Mommy and Mommy's Day. He had a, a role in both of those, uh, and we've done other things. We did a, a comic book, you may recall, Mike Danger. Mm -hmm. So we did a bunch of projects. We never really wrote, we never wrote a book together because Mickey was very protective of particularly Mike Hammer. And so he, he never was really ghosted. So he, um, but he and I became really good friends and he sent several unfinished Hammer manuscripts home with me just for, for my fun and my enjoyment. And then he in 2006, got very ill with pancreatic cancer, and he was working on what he conceived as the last of my camera novel, which was called The Goliath Bone, and he was very close to the end of that book, um, 
And he called me on the phone. This is within days of his passing. And he said, I don't think I'm going to be able to finish this. If I can't, would you finish it for me? And I said, of course, I hope I don't have to, but it's the biggest honor I've ever been paid. Well, apparently he hung up from that, got thinking, and he went to his wife, Jane, and said, take everything you find around here and give it to Max. He'll know what to do. Hmm. And so uh, an interesting sidelight of that is that Mickey was a Jehovah's Witness, and some of what, some of the reason for uh, why he didn't publish as much is that as a Jehovah's Witness, his fellow witnesses frowned upon his work. Now, they accepted his money when they wanted a new kingdom hall, but they did frown upon his work. So he, to some degree, I think, compromised it a little bit and sometimes would put things aside and get to a point where he'd say, no, I can't finish this or I'll get myself in trouble with mm -hmm. my church, which is just bizarre, but that's the truth. So that's one of the reasons why there were so many manuscripts that were, were unfinished, that were had substantial beginnings, but, but had not been completed. So Jane said to him, now, Mickey, you know that Max is not a Jehovah's Witness. He's going to do, you turn these over to him. Uh, he's not going to be bound by any, uh, you know, any hesitations you might have had. He said, no problem. Let Max do what he wants to do with them. Mm. And so... After Mickey's passing, we went down, my wife, Barbara, and I, who's also a writer, as I think you know, mm -hmm. we went down to to Merle's Inlet, South Carolina, for a big celebration of Mickey's life that was done in, in his, his, his front yard with tents, and you know, a lot of people came, spoke about him, remembered him. And uh, so when the shooting was over, shall we say, uh, Barbara and I and Jane went to Mickey's three offices. He had three offices at home. He had one on stilts, which somehow su uh, survived Hurricane Hugo. He had one downstairs that was a traditional library where he had, you know, just wall one of those wonderful libraries of walls of books. They were all by him, of course, <laughs> all, the, all the foreign editions. Mm. So, um, but he also had an upstairs office. And we found material in every office because he would bounce from office to office. And we sat at a big banquet type table, well, a big dining room table, not a banquet type table. And, but I mean, I was here and, and Jane was off to one end and Barbara's off here. And we each had stacks of material. We were going through sorting and every now and then someone would yell, I've got a hammer. <laughs> and, and because that was the goal to find the hammers. And so uh, I came out of that with... Was that Mary Travers, by the way, who'd shout that? Pardon me? Was that Mary Travers who would shout, I got a hammer? No, Jane... No. no sorry. You're, 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 being, you're being naughty. <laughs> I'm focused. Stay I'm focused sorry. On. Stay focused. Uh, but, so Jane would, would yell that out. And I ended up with, I had six substantially uh, begun books. They, they ranged from... The Goliath Bone, where he had a fairly complete manuscript, except for the ending. And, but interestingly, because he knew he, knew he was dying, and he, he wrote very quickly, and he wrote about, he wrote 12 chapters in what he, in about 150 pages, where he normally would have written 300. Hmm. So the chapters were short and needed fleshing out. So I, I had to immediately dive in with not just... It's never, Bob, it's never been where I pick up where he leaves off. I always, I always view that as rough draft material and I expand it, mm -hmm. trying to maintain a voice that is similar to his. So that, so when people say that they can't tell where Spillane ends and Collins begins, it's because Collins begins in page one with, with Spillane. Now, certainly there will be five or six pages that are pure Mickey. Uh, and I, really try to stay away from doing too much tampering. But a typical thing I would do is if Mickey kind of skipped a scene, I would write the scene. Hmm. Uh, a good example of that is that in, in the Goliath bone, very early on, he goes to talk to, to Pat Chambers, his cop friend. And, no, this was in the Big Bang. That was the second one. He goes to talk, he's talking to his friend, Pat Chambers, after a violent incident has happened on the street. 
And as the scene begins, they're talking about the fact that that Mike has just torn the the DA a, a new well. I guess we can say asshole here. Can you, can, we? you can say it. Yeah. All right. Uh, good. I'll say asshole. Then. <laughs> he, so so at the beginning of this scene, there's there's been a scene we haven't seen between my camera and and the DA. So I wrote that scene. Hmm. And that kind of thing would happen where I felt like Mickey was skipping things and uh, sometimes not fleshing things out. I tend to do more um, setting and uh, he does mood. But I will do more setting and physical description and and clothing. And I'm also writing these books. Each one is in the period where it was written. So if if it's a 1964 manuscript, I have a bit of a job to make sure it's almost an historical novel about 64. So everything tells you that's where we are. Or if it's in the 50s, the one that I just did was... 1945. So that had a very different feel. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the books are quite different. It's been in comic book terms, they're continuity implants, aren't they? You're, you're, you're going between stories and sliding something in. The difference here is that, that they're Mickey's stories. After I did the first six, I had another batch that maybe the, I had 30 or 40 pages to deal with. Now I'm up to where the last one I did before this all I had was uh, two chapters. Mm. But Mickey was a writer who, as a mystery, he's not really given credit as a mystery writer because they always talk about him in noir terms, sex and violence and all that. But he was quite, quite an adept, almost Agatha Christie-like mystery writer. So in those first two chapters, that's a book called The Will to Kill, everything was set up. Every character in the book was was set up so that I I had a very clear path. I also know how he thinks, so I almost I always have a very good idea of what ending he was going for. Hmm. Now, if you read Killing Town, it has a, a pretty cool ending, and yeah, I'm absolutely very sure that Mickey was headed in that direction because, and I will give a non sequitur to your audience. Because he was very specific about setting up that there was a fish glue plant in this <laughs> town. And once I saw fish glue, I was like, why is he doing fish glue? <laughs> so I have to sit and think, where could he have been going? Yeah. Because uh, if, you know, if, if a woman is taking alcohol baths, you know by at the end of the book she's going to burn to death. I mean, that's how Mickey's mind worked. Right. So that's how my mind has to work. Uh, so, so it's been a really great experience. But now, as I say, I'm getting toward the end of where I have the Mickey material. And I really don't feel like writing these out of whole cloth. That wasn't my mandate. My mandate as a fan, let's finish these books he started. Right. It's interesting, too, isn't it, that you wound up writing the last Mickey, I mean, and the last first. of my camera, and the first... Yep. Uh, and that Mickey himself knew he, those needed to be told. Or, well, I mean, certainly with the first one, he had, when he started writing these, even though he didn't publish it, he, he was looking at a starting place. And near the end, he was looking at a finishing place. But you wound That's up, right. you know, uh, having a big hand, obviously, in both, which, uh, you know, that's pretty cool in of itself. And then you bounced Very around cool. in between, you know, the 60s and the 80s. You were all and, over and, the place. And I think that may frustrate some readers because I know that readers tend, not all, uh, but readers tend to like the early stuff, mm -hmm. the stuff that he did in the, in the late 40s and the 1950s. And so I can't dictate when he wrote them, and I'm certainly not going to take a book he wrote in the 19, started in the 1980s and turn it into a 1950s My Camera. My job is to, and what, and that's kind of how I prepare. I read the stuff fore and aft. So if it's a 1960s book, I read several of the 1960s novels, and then what he wrote next. And while I'm not trying to ape the style as much as I am the the tone, and also where where's my camera and Mickey? Where are they in this journey? Because Hammer changes a great deal. He, he's very unusual for a series character because he really he really grows and changes. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that's not typical. Perry Mason in the first couple of books is the same Perry Mason in the last right. number 100, you know. Nero Wolf and, and Archie get pretty well established in about the first three books, and then they don't change much after that. Well, even your own. I mean, Corey didn't really, doesn't really change that much in the series, does he? Well, he's a little, he doesn't change as much as Mike Hammer does. Right. I do I do think that that Quarry changes uh, because there there are basically three phases there. There's him as a hitman, and that goes up through the book Quarry. But all these prequels that I've done, starting with a book called First Quarry, then there's what I call the list books, and that's where. Quarry is, is tracking other hired killers and working for their potential victims, which to me is an improvement in his moral viewpoint, yeah, I shall we say. That. Sure. And, uh, and also part of his unrealizing a self-suicide. He keeps killing himself over and over again. He's, he's not really happy with how he turned out. Although he would never admit that, he would never even realize it. And then there's a few books toward the end where he's in his retirement and his retirement gets interrupted. Hmm. Um, and so it is tricky because I have to keep track of that continuity and I'm very bad at math. <laughs> so I have, and then I have to go back and read my own clues and like, Oh, okay. Carter, Carter is running for president. So that puts this book around here. Mm -hmm. So I made this decision, conscious decision, People always say conscious decisions. If some decisions are unconscious, I guess they are. But I made that decision, like, this is a good time to tell the story, but I wasn't really thinking about the overarching thing. And then later I have to sit down and go, what are these puzzle pieces that I'm putting together? But, yeah, I would say he does not have the dramatic change. Uh, Hammer, by the end, is uh, has mellowed much as Mickey had. But he's still tough. And he's still my camera. Oh, sure. And what was the, as a writer, uh, what has been the easiest part of finishing books uh, started by Mickey? And what's been, you know, what, what part of it just really is hard for you, if, if there is such a thing? Uh, as I've said, and I think I told you, I'm not intimidated about this. I, I felt like I, tra I unwittingly trained. It was the same thing when I got the Dick Tracy comic strip. I had unwittingly trained for it for 15, 20 years with no idea that it would ever come to my doorstep. So, uh, so with Spillane, I'd do, been, doing, been doing that same preparation. So the problems I have have to do more with craft so that I might be doing something like uh, where Mickey's – well, I'll give you a good example. There's a book called Kiss Her Goodbye. Sure. Mickey took two runs at it, and they they had he had different plots. They started kind of the same, and went in different directions. I looked at those and said, "Well, I can't do two books with the same beginning, but if I can figure out a way to address both of these plots and intertwine these plots, then I have even more spine material in the book, which is always a goal for me." And so that became the challenge. How can I make this one story, something he conceived as two stories? That's craft. Uh, he did a bit the same thing on King of the Weeds, where he did he went in sort of two different directions and two drafts. And again, and I look, I saved that for a long time because I thought this is a nightmare. I do not have any idea how I can salvage this. And I know this particular story meant a lot to Mickey. Because it was designed as a sequel to what was his last published book, Black Alley, his last movie camera. And I thought, I, w I was kind of dreading it, which may sound funny, as a Mike, Mike Hammer fan, writer, dreads doing a Spillane story. But I just thought the challenges were, maybe I wasn't up to it. And it turned out really good. I think it's one of the two or three best ones. And I think Mickey's work is really strong in it, and I think my work is really strong in it. Um, and I, so you have little, you have little tricky things to deal with in a book called Lady Go Die. I had a a first chapter. I had no first chapter. 
that made it, that's one of the reasons why I waited a while to do it hmm. till I'd done a number of these because I, the idea of writing a first chapter to a Mike Cameron novel, that's so key in Spillane. He was so good at first chapters. That was intimidating. Hmm. That really was intimidating. So that got set aside. And that was the second My Camera novel. Now the third, since I found the other one. So uh, the story we had to do with kind of a serial killer. And I had a first chapter of a serial killer novel that Mickey had done. And never written. Just one chapter. And I thought, maybe I can use that. No, it didn't work. Hmm. And that chapter... Lady Godaya was started probably in 47, and uh, this book, the chapter, the lone chapter was 64. So I got this idea that that chapter could come in the middle of this book. So I get there, and then I realize, oh, I'm dealing with 1960s in my camera in this chapter. So that was tricky. Now I had to take it. I did for that chapter. I have to walk hammer back. So, so see these these may be I mean, they, this may be boring to people, but it's it's craft. It's trying to figure out how to make this stuff work and to be faithful to Mickey's intent. And I I try more to be true to Hammer as a character than to to try to write like Mickey. Now there's times where I write like Mickey anyway. If I get to the ending, I'm going to be writing like Mickey. It's mm-hmm. going to sound like Mickey. Um, I'm real proud of the endings of these books because Mickey was all about endings. He used to say, you don't, you don't tell a joke to get, Oh no, you don't, you don't tell a joke without a punchline. That's one of his, his, uh, his dictums. The other one was you don't read a book to get to the middle. <laughs> and so I'm always conscious of that, that beginning. Think about the beginning of kiss me deadly. The woman in the, who jumps in front of the car and then the ending, movie and book, although they're different, are all about fire. Mm. Just big hammer having to crawl out of a burning burning uh, building. So those are really important. And I try to make sure that the end, the beginnings and the endings really, really have that spillane punch. I wanted to ask you, still stylistically, I guess, uh, about pacing in terms of... It, maybe it's just me, but I thought this was the fastest... I'd ever gone through a Max oh, nice. Collins, right? I mean, it just, I don't, I can't explain it. Actually, I was going to ask you if, if when you're writing it, you have any sense of, oh, you know, this one is moving faster. People, are, people aren't going to be able to put this one down. They're going to try, but they're not going to be able to put this down. I went through it for me with everything else going on remarkably fast. I had no intention of even getting to the end because I try not to read novels before, read them to the end before I interview someone because I don't want to slip and give anything away. But I just couldn't put it down. And are you so are you aware when, when you're writing and you're pacing that that could be different from one book to the other? Yes, but I think I, I, I give Mickey the credit here because he the beginning of that story is is incredible. And then he's got this wild setup, which, as you know, has has a guy who's essentially come in like a hobo. Hammer comes in hopping a freight to sneak into this town. Uh, trying to avoid a bunch of mobsters, basically. And he immediately is arrested for rape and murder and is in a very bad place. And he gets bailed out in a remarkable way, just a crazy way. And so uh, to take that and make that work and, and to, to pay it off was, was a challenge. But the pace had already been set by Mickey and again, there, there. It's not two stories, but there's two agendas in that story. You have Hammer has come to town to basically do a favor for a dying friend who was a war buddy of his, of course, an army buddy of his. But he also has the situation in the town where he he'd been accused of this rape and murder, and there are, there are brothers that think he's the murderer of the of, of the of woman who was raped and killed and so there's just a lot going on a lot to deal with so you don't have a lot of rumination in a book like that you just you just go from one thing to another so I, I yeah I'm proud of that when some people have been saying they think it's one of the best even the best of the books 
But this is only the second time I've been able to write early Hammer, hmm. really, really early Hammer, which is uh, Lady Go Die, which was basically a first take on a book called The, the Twisted Thing that he put aside. And then, then this one. Mostly I've been dealing with that period after where, where Mickey sort of retired from my camera. Another early one, though, I did get to do the book immediately after Kiss Me Deadly, which would have been around 54. And that's that's called Kill Me Darling, mm -hmm. which I think is another one of the strong ones. So I have the most fun when I can write about young my camera. Hmm. But I, lo I love them all. Speaking of sort of speaking of young my camera, sort of. I was I was sorry to hear that uh, Stacy Keach, who played Hammer on TV, is no longer doing the audiobooks. But it did bring up an, uh, a question in my mind: Has the revival of Hammer and the Spillane work? Uh, will we any any hint that we'll be seeing any more uh, Hammer TV or film? Any you know will will he jump into other media at this point? I think so. Uh, my my Hollywood guy who lives in Chicago, of course, with of course. with me. Uh, is is working on that very hard. I have a really interesting project that is in sort of early stages, which I haven't talked about anywhere. So this is a scoop for, for Mr. Media. But uh, last year, uh, Gary Sandy, who had been in my movie Mommy State, Gary Sandy from WKRP, sure. Sure. Uh, we had done a couple of years ago a radio play based on one of the Stacey Keach audiobooks we did. You know, we did two radio style audiobooks before we did the just the reading of the books where we had full casts and uh, I got approached to have it done in Owensboro Kentucky at a festival radio style with people you know with with, with the sound effects table and all that stuff and Gary played to hammer it was a great great fun and then I got contacted last year and there's a theater in Clearwater Florida amazing I Ruth I was, I was just going to say that was that was here. That's where I am. Yeah, Gary and, was here. Uh, Gary did a great job, and I adapted it a little bit, and they opened it up a little bit. They they have the radio aspect, but Gary was off. They did not use a script, and there was action, and they moved around it. So it was very well received. Hmm. And so uh, I'm talking to them now. We're going to do another one, which is the other of the two. Uh, radio style plays I originally did with Stacy, and um, looks like there's a good chance I'm going to direct the play this time and then we're discussing shooting it as a lot you know if Jesus Christ Superstar can be done live I don't see why my camera can't be done live Agreed. and uh, we're working on that really hard that the everything isn't signed sealed and delivered on that but it for sure will be presented at Ruth Eckert Hall. Oh, very cool. That is, which that's, is a fantastic, I mean, that's, if you know that place. Since like the day to, it opened. <laughs> well, to give people a perspective of what that place is, there were two theaters going the night that the nights that we did, uh, did my, opened my camera down there. It was called Encore for Murder. And we're in kind of what they call a black box theater where it's two or three hundred people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but next door, it was Jackson Brown with 2,000 people mm -hmm. in the seats. So it's a big facility, as you as you well know. And they know what they're doing. The guy there is, is named Zev Buffman, who runs it, who is a – I think he would not be offended if I said he was an old-time Broadway guy. He brought Elizabeth Taylor to Broadway, for example. Mm -hmm. So he knows his stuff. He really knows his stuff. Oh, yeah. They, they were very lucky to get him. He came – Oh. He went to Broadway and then I think to Miami for many years, and then he came up here. And you would have thought, well, maybe he'll be here for a year or two because he's not a young guy. But man, he and I, I figured he had had to have had something to do with doing a live radio play because you'd have to be from a certain era to even right. think or understand how that might even work. So yeah, that's pretty but, cool. But Zev was the guy that said we need to open it up because I had written it just as a radio play. And when they told me they were going to open it up, I was very skeptical because it requires a very sort of surrealistic, because you, you have, you, you, you're not going to have a lot of sets. You have something that will represent the office and you're sitting in a chair when you're driving the car. And I, so, so I was kind of skeptical, 
they pulled it off and they sold me. Hmm. And uh, so I rewrote it and really opened it up. And this is uh, I'm very, very excited about this. And uh, so I may be essentially uh, directing a My Camera movie. Cool. And it's, maybe we'll see you in Clearwater. You definitely will. Oh, excellent. Well, I think uh, I think you and I will have to meet over at the original uh, yes. Hooters, and I'll I'll buy the first round of wings and beer for you. Okay. Uh, all right. Of course, neither one of us should be eating wings. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll go past we'll that. Get into that. Can, can I get buffalo shrimp instead? Uh, absolutely. Thank absolutely. You. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's come back to Corey for a minute. Um, we've got a couple more things we'll hit on and then I'll let you out of here. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry to say that because I'm not a Cinemax subscriber, I did not get to see Corey. I was very frustrated by that. Uh, it's come to an end, but I wondered, were you happy with the way he was portrayed on screen? They did a really good job. I liked it a lot. The, uh, I wrote one episode as it happened while I got credit for one episode. They took my script and they used about half of it in one episode and half of it in another. So the, the, the vagaries of Hollywood uh, credits. But I, did, I was one of the writers on the show, although I wasn't in the writer's room. Hmm. Uh, I was on set a little bit. Um, I, my only complaint about the show, and that's too strong, is that they were afraid or at least i think it was more the lead actor didn't do the humor uh the 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 sarcastic dry dark humor now the dark humor was in the show and they had they they really used there's an actor who whose name i wish i could remember he's so wonderful uh he's the guy who played uh, uh dewey on justified uh he 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 was Corey's sidekick that wasn't Walton books, Goggins. He's pardon me. That wasn't Walton Goggins. No, no. Uh, it's okay. it's this this this. I'm so yeah, sorry. I can't, I can't remember his name. Can't, uh, yeah. But he uh, he was uh, the Boyd character in the books. Hmm. Uh, Corey's uh, gay partner. They cha- actually changed his name to Buddy because they didn't because well. Uh, Coggins had played a character called Boyd in Justified, and they they didn't want any confusion, uh, particularly since they were using some Justified actors. Mm. Anyway, um, so there was humor in it. But Corey himself, that that aspect of him, there's no voiceover, so that that was my only disappointment. But they essentially did an origin story. They they took about probably five paragraphs out of out of the first book I wrote about Corey and built, you know, him coming back, not being able to get a job, uh, having his, his wife cheat on him, all of that stuff, how, how the broker approaches his, approaches him to become a, a, a contract killer. So, so it's a wonderful story I never wrote, but they did a, they did a bang up job on it. And we were working on a second season and I had written a script for the second season and then the second season didn't happen. So I, I think we would have gone. Even. The second season was going to be based on primarily uh, Quarry's Choice, which is one of my two favorite novels from the series. Hmm. Did and just just curious, did the uh, the season that it ran did it, did it have any impact on book sales? Oh yes, and we got the four the the first five books back in print hmm. uh, from Hard Case Crime. They've been available as print on demand from a small company called. Uh, perfect crime but we got to put them out there with robert mcginnis covers and i take credit for that i'll tell you how (laughs) okay uh the the editor charles or said uh it's really hard for us to get the get covers for five books because they're going to bring them out at the same time and we're really concerned because the look of hard case crime is that retro wonderful uh look that is so politically incorrect with the beautiful women in scanty costumes if a costume at all and i and uh robert mcginnis is the king of this stuff and he has had done several of my books and so i said well contact bob mcginnis who's now about 90 i think <laughs> wonderful guy i said contact him i said there's got to be some some paintings that got rejected or never got used somebody went out of business and and he had, he happened to have five, there were five, no, 
think about this. We needed five covers. He happened to have five that had never been used. Wow. And so we got all five covers, and I was able to say, well, this this one would go with that book okay, and this one would go with that book okay. And, and so all of a sudden, I'm out there with five Robert McGinnis covers. Wow. Uh, sometimes dreams come true. Nice. Very nice. Just like you sometimes survive open heart surgery, I understand. I hear that. Yeah, <laughs> I hear that can go pretty well. Um, all right, let's uh, let's let's touch on a couple of the things quickly, sure. and then we'll we'll let you get out of here. Um, you have a completely unrelated book coming up, uh, uh, Scarface and the Untouchable. Yes. T- tell us about that. When's that coming out? Well, that's coming out in August. It's co-written by a, a wonderful young uh, historian writer named A. Brad Schwartz. He is right now a doctorate candidate at uh, Princeton. So apparently he couldn't get into Muscatine Community College. Like I did. <laughs> and he's, he's A. Period Brad Schwartz. And I kid him because I say, you may be A. Brad Schwartz, but I'm V. Max Allen Collins. There you so, go. so keep that in mind. Uh, he's He was a young fan. Ten years ago, he tracked me down. He came to uh, my play, An Untouchable Life in Des Moines. He started coming to my book signings at Centuries and Sleuths in Forest Park, Illinois, Chicago, basically. And we got to know each other. And he, he started saying, we should do a an Elliot Ness biography. And I thought, I, I thought the play I did was the end of that. Well, he published a book about Orson Welles called Broadcast Hysteria, where he almost coined the phrase fake news. And so he, he got very hot really quickly. And so I'm always willing to tag along with somebody who's successful. And so we began talking about it. And uh, we originally, the idea was that we would do Elliot Ness right because we felt that he had been mishandled in other books. But I had done all this research for my Elliot Ness and Cleveland books. And a lot of my research was appropriated by, by other writers, other graphic novelists, other, you know, and nonfiction writers, and and I, and all this hard work that I had done with a guy named George Hagenauer, uh, incredible research. We never got credited because they appeared in fiction books. And for a long time, people have said, you know, so much about Elliot Ness, you should do the definitive biography. So Brad and I got together and started talking about that. As happens sometimes, a rival book came out about Ness. And so you say, oh, have I been beaten to the punch? So I thought, here, let's do a dual biography of Capone and Ness, Hmm. because that hasn't been done, and that's a new approach. So that's the approach we took. Initially, we were going to do them cradle to grave, but the Chicago story, and that's why the subtitle is Al Capone, Elliot Ness, and the Battle for Chicago, the Chicago story just needed a book of its own. We are actually going to do a, a follow-up hmm. about the rest of Ness's life. That's going to be called uh, The Untouchable and the Butcher. And you probably know that's the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run in Cleveland. Hmm. Uh, so so anyway, we uh, we put a proposal together. We, we, and we've been work, we worked for a number of years on this. I think about three years on this project. And it's like 150,000 words. And I swear to you, Bob, it is the definitive book on Capone, the definitive book on on Ness. We found stuff out nobody knew. Hmm. For for example, the untouchable Elliot Ness, the, uh, who, who was a, a very honest guy, lied on his, his uh, government forms because he wasn't old enough to be an agent. Hmm. And his wrong birthday has been reported by everybody but us, pretty much. Uh, also, Capone and Ness lived on the same street in Chicago for really? a good long time. Yes, that's never been remarked upon. Uh, also, uh, there was a major move within the Capone organization, shall we say, to help Capone get convicted. This is stuff that's not really been talked about, hmm. not in any depth. And the research that mostly was done by Brad, amazing. Uh, very proud of this. So people were, are going to want to get a hold of that. And then now, you, the last time I wrote, ahead, last sorry. time I wrote an Elliot Ness thing that was 
more accurate than what had come before had Batman in it. <laughs> well, that's what I was just going to come into that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, you have uh, Batman Elseworlds number three, right? That's uh, yes. due out, I guess, any day now yeah. as we're talking. Uh, maybe. So is that the fake news, Elliot Ness? <laughs> no, it's actually, I always say it's, it's the most accurate version of what was the Cleveland Heights investigation. Uh, which actually precedes the Untouchables investigation that had ever been done, except for it had Batman in it. <laughs> so that was super accurate. Uh, although it's a different Batman, it's not it's not uh, Bruce Wayne Batman because this is Elseworlds. Ah. So uh, and that's back out, and I'm really glad. It's been incredibly surprising and gratifying to me that so many people now like my Batman work because I was. I think undoubtedly the most vilified Batman writer in the history of the uh, of, of the character. You, even Bob Kane didn't get as bad a press as I got. <laughs> and now, now people that grew up reading those comics and loving them uh, are saying good things to me. Hmm. Well, I've got one, one last question for you. Yes. Uh, we'll let you get out of here. Uh, it goes all the way back to Spillane. Uh, as yeah. a man who's had several of his own characters, including Quarry and... Uh, uh, Nathan um, Heller, um, would you ever see yourself? Maybe I've asked you this before, but would you ever see yourself doing what Mickey did and and asking someone to step in and finish your work, or have you pretty much finished everything you've started? Uh, I, you know, I'm a I'm a recycler, so there's very little in my drawer that I haven't already found a way to, you know, to deal with. Um, if I were working on something, I would. I'd be fine with that. I'm sure my wife w would be able to find somebody. I have some very talented writer friends, uh, Steve Mertz, Bob Randisi. Unfortunately, we lost Ed Gorman, who would have been my, uh, frankly, my first choice because we were very close. Um, and then there's Barbara Self, who, if, uh, if we were working on an antiques book, she could definitely finish it by herself. Hmm. Um, and, uh, there's also my son, who's an incredible writer. He is uh, a translator of Japanese into English. He has done about eight books so far, wow. including wow. the latest version of Battle Royale. I mean, this is a major young writer. He's put all his writing talent into the translations. But someday, uh, maybe when I'm gone, he's, he's going to step up to the plate and do his own stuff. And uh, I'm kind of setting him up to write about Nathan Heller's son. Uh, I said, you, you know, you could have Nathan Heller solve the, the OJ case. It would, it would be a short, short. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, all right, listen, folks, you can order Max Allen Collins' latest collaboration with the late Mickey Spillane, Killing Town, uh, which was the lost first Mike Hammer thriller, or any of the others that they've worked on together, or the Quarry books, or the Nathan Heller books, uh, or the Antiques books that, that uh, under Barbara Allen uh, that he's written with his wife over the years. Uh, wherever great books are sold, or you can order any of them right now at a great price on MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. If you are watching the video on the website, MrMedia.com, under the video, you'll see probably over there or maybe over there, you'll see covers of the books. You can click on them right now. It'll take you to Amazon. You can uh, order, the, order the hard copy. You can download the ebook, whatever you like. Get it immediately. Um, Max, you've got a website that kind of acts as your blog or a blog that acts as a website. Yeah. Uh, you want to tell people where they can find that? Well, it's maxallencollins.com. Very clever. I'm going to assume you know to put www dot in front of it. And uh, I do a weekly, I call it an update. And it's uh, every Tuesday morning around nine o'clock it comes up and my son helps me run it. And I do I do what is, I guess, a blog entry. And it also includes links to reviews, positive ones. <laughs> <laughs> Find the negative ones on your own. Yeah, really. And articles. And there, there was a lot done about Mickey because of the centenary. And there's were many articles that I linked to. Hmm. Uh, and I wrote. About two weeks ago, I wrote about our 50th anniversary, my wife, Barb, and I. We got married in 1968, and she is a beautiful woman still. She is. I thought 
did, is this like a second marriage? Because this woman's oh. way too young and good looking for, you know. For Max? Ah, I, I agree. I mean, I agree. and then to see that you two have been together, I want to add that to see that you've been together for 50 years, then I thought, what a lucky <clears throat> guy yeah, he is. No, you know? I'm very lucky. And she turned out to be a great writer, too. Yeah. So the antiques books are among the best-selling things I've ever done. We're at the we're working on the 14th one right now. Wow. Well, may, <laughs> maybe sometime what we need to do is have you and Barbara come on and sit together and we'll talk about the antiques books. Well, she's like all beautiful women of a certain age. She doesn't like to get around cameras too much. Ah. And she's crazy. She's crazy. But a couple of years ago, we used to always go on a local uh, talk show uh, and uh, – she saw herself on HD and she said, I will never allow myself to be shot in high definition again. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a shame. But all right. I understand. I understand. <laughs> uh, Max, it is uh, so good to see you, see you, hear you sounding well, looking good. And uh, as always, uh, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for the, the very kind comments.